Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our last IFRS webinar for 2019. Um, and um, thank you for joining me again today. I have to start this webinar with a huge apology. And that is um, last month when I was doing this webinar on my own, And without my normal partner, Kevin, along um, with me, you were watching for the whole webinar. And I couldn't believe um, how dedicated our clients have been to stay for the journey. Hopefully, you've managed to download in the handout section the slide, have it in front of you. Apologize for that oversight on my side. Um, I um, on that note, again, today in December, I'm doing it on my own. Uh, Kevin um, has got some family. His sister and family here from South Africa. And in South Africa, you know, December is holiday month, so he's entertaining them, and this Kevin will be back. At apology for. Them. that um, you at lessons um, from him be 16 one January 2019 as well as the normal year ends have already done a lot of a lot of clients in Australia, that's the standard became effective. I'm on that. Be 16. So, really, we're trying to make it very the problem here, which is a significant decision. A lot of discussion welcome to this webinar. So, if I hopefully um, I've moved it so people can see it. Oh dear, let me just make sure that I've now moved the slides so only people can see the to the effective date. There's an effective date. The effective date of this standard is Is for annual reporting periods on or after 1 January 2019. If you look at the sections, um, there's scope in AASB 16. I've tried to start with the first one, which is scope. 
um, and a recession. The ISB um, has a number of recessions. One is short-term leases, and the other one is leases um, of low-value assets. And I thought maybe we should have a bit of a discussion exactly what means. Um, again, this, the short and the leases of low value assets both are practical expedients. So you don't have to use these practical expedients. If you want to apply the standard to short term leases or leases of low value assets, you can do that. Um, um, but, but if you want to use the practical expedients, obviously you can do that as well. Uh, it's available. So if we look at short-term leases, now short-term leases are defined as leases that at the commencement date have a lease term of 12 months or less and a lease that contains a purchase option is not a short-term lease. Um, now I think it's really important to note that before you decide that it's a short term, um, that it wouldn't be good enough to say that I've got a lease of 11 months and 29 days and say, okay, it's less than 12 months, now it is short term. Um, when you look at your term um, to assess whether it's short term or not, you'll also take into account potential extension options. So if you've got 11 months and 29 days um, and then there's also a, a termination option um, there's also an option to extend etc um, you would take all of that in in your in consideration um, so you know short-term lease the spirit of a short-term lease is a genuine short-term lease you're leasing a holiday apartment for two weeks or you're leasing a vehicle to drive around for a few weeks when you're on a trip overseas um, so it has to be less than 12 months and you consider all these other options associated with the lease in order to make that assessment so I think that's important. The other one to look at is leases of low value assets. A few key things. Um, the assessment of low value for a leased asset um, is not linked on to the payments. So some people think if my payments are $5, then I'm okay. Um, you have to actually look at the value of the underlying asset. Is the underlying asset that you're leasing of a low value? And then there's guidance around what does low value mean? Um, number one, you would look at um, the value of the asset that you're leasing as if If it was new, even if you're leasing a set vehicle, if I bought this vehicle new, what would I pay today? And is that of low value? So it doesn't matter whether it's a genuinely a lease or asset, irrelevant. Thing is, you look at the assets that you're leasing on an individual basis. So if you are leasing a um, hundred or two thousand land laptops and each laptop individually is of low value, you can still use the um, asset exemption. Um, they also say that an underlying lease is of low value only if the lessee can benefit from the use of the underlying asset on its own or together with other resources that are readily available to the lessee and, and the underlying asset is not highly dependent on or highly inflated with other assets. So that's where they say saying you cannot come up and say, listen, I've got an aircraft or a vehicle and we're going to split it in a thousand leases of low value and the stairs to the airplane etc anything else associated with and any component cannot own related with other assets so you cannot break one asset down into small little parts now the one is if people say we think our printer or photocopier is a low value asset less than five thousand us dollars or more or less less than seven thousand aussie dollars i would say hang on we have to think about this is this a printer that 
every staff member have a printer in their office that can work independently with your laptop? Or is this one of those printers that's connected to the Wi-Fi and the computer system and your body prints off this big network. How can we, uh, you know, usually the, those kind of printers, uh, etc., are of a higher value. They break it down into small components because they all work together to get the photocopying or the printing done. Um, the examples provided in the standard of low value leases or low value assets that could be leased, and this was the intention, would be tablets and personal computers, small items of office furniture, telephones, fax machines, etc. cetera. Um, but I think very important that you should not focus on the monthly payment or the size of the monthly payment, but the underlying asset that is being leased. So I just wanted to flip section scope and the expedience available around low value assets and short term leases. The next thing I thought we should look at is identities. Now identifying a lease um, has a number of problem areas at we know we have to look at embedded leases and we know we have to look at service agreements and read service agreements and all legal agreements very carefully uh, to determine whether uh, there's actually a lease embedded in it. However, I thought we should also touch on separation of lease components. Um, as you know, the standard says um, lease components and non-lease components can be separated. Again, you can separate them, you don't have to. If you decide to keep them together, you have to keep them together and treat them as a right of use asset and lease liability. So if you want to keep it together, then it has to be a lease. If you want to if if you split it out and you go through all of that effort, then you can treat your um, separate outside AASB 16 and you treat your lease component within AASB 16. Now, this is an interesting one and we see it quite a lot. Um, and what it says is for a contract that contains a lease component, um, an entity accounts for each lease component within the contract separately from non-lease components. However, a lessee may apply a practical expedient by a class of underlying asset and ignore the requirement to separate non-leased components from lease components. So you could, as a practical expedient, decide to keep the two together. Um, for example, a contract for the lease of an asset together with its maintenance during the lease term can be accounted for in its entirely as a lease contract, entirety as a lease contract, rather than accounting for the asset separate from the maintenance service. Um, important to note, this practical expedient is only available to lessees. So it does not apply to a lessor. So if you have a let lease where you're a lessee, you can keep it together. However, if you also have a sublease where you're the lessor, you cannot use that practical expedient. The other thing that's important is if we use, if we decide to not use this practical expedient, remember the practical expedients are usually to make things easier. Therefore, the practical expedient is to put the two together and just treat it as one. If you don't want to do that, and if you want to keep the lease component and non-lease component separate, a lessee must allocate the total contract consideration to the lease and non-lease component on the basis of their relative standalone prices. And that is a concept that's very similar to what we find in the new IFRS 15, particularly in step four, where we allocate the total transaction price to the performance obligations based on their relative standalone price. Now, in practice, often it's difficult to identify those relative standalone prices. So if the standalone prices are not available, um, then they must try, um, then um, one should try and estimate those relative standalone uh, prices. What we've seen in practice is that can be complex, judgmental, 
Um, so applying the practical expedient genuinely simplifies the calculation and a lot of our clients have decided to, to use this practical expedient. Um, the downside of using the practical expedient is that you get to a larger right of use asset on your balance sheet and a larger um, lease liability on your balance sheet. So that's the risk. So definitely easier to put together. However, you know, it's a larger asset, larger liability, um, larger depreciation expense in future, uh, larger interest expense um, over the period. So that's just to think about uh, lease components very carefully. Wow. <coughs> um, I think the other thing um, that we've seen is to, is to do a real assessment on the cost benefit of estimating standalone selling prices or standalone prices for individual components or not. Um, often um, entities would say, listen, we do not want to put it together. We don't want the big impact on the balance sheet and profit and loss in future. However, if they realize the complexity and the effort required to separate it out, you know, it's just not worth it. So that cost benefit assessment is important, especially if you consider how significant or material the maintenance component in a lease is or the security component, et cetera. Um, the other thing um, that, that's interesting is even if you you know even if you decide to keep the two together, um, you could find that maintenance costs are variable in nature. Um, so you know in your lease agreement you don't know what your maintenance cost will be. Um, it's released on an annual basis, and therefore when you do your lease calculation you're going to exclude it anyway um, because in your lease calculation, uh, you'll also, well, you'll only include fixed amounts and fixed payments. So in a way, by keeping the two together, um, to make it simple, and then exclude the maintenance cost because it's variable, you get to a very similar position in an easier way, for sure. Um, the other thing that I thought we should talk about is cloud computing. Now, this is another one that's been to the Interpretations Committee. And in March this year, um, they've actually released the following agenda decision around cloud computing. Um, now, cloud computing, I think, is very common these days. A lot of people use software as a service. Uh, I know you can also use infrastructure as a service, etc. And the question is, if you use um, cloud computing, would that be a lease? Are you actually leasing the software? So in this situation, the interpretation committee said, um, we've discussed a customer's right to access a supplier's application software hosted on a cloud for a specified term. I suppose this is very similar to what BDO has. Uh, our software product, BDO Lead for Lease Accounting, is uh, hosted um, in the cloud, Microsoft. Soft Azure and our clients um, have access uh, to BDO lead in the cloud. Um, so the request went to the interpretations committee and asked whether a customer receives a software asset at the contract commencement or whether they receive a service over the contract term. Um, so if they receive a service, uh, no asset or liability is recognized, it is expensed um, as you receive your service. However, if we say um, they receive an asset, uh, potentially because it's a lease, it will go onto the balance sheet. Um, the committee observed that as part of that definition of IFRS 16, um, a contract must convey the right to use an asset. And that is different to, um, for a contract to convey the right to use an asset. The customer would need to have the right to obtain substantially all of the economic benefit from the use of the asset and the right to direct the use of the asset. Now, if you look at a normal software as a service situation, um, the customer has the right to receive uh, future access to the supplier software on cloud. 
infrastructure, but it doesn't give the customer any decision-making rights about how and for what purpose that software is used. Um, so the customer says, I've got right to access the software in the cloud, but it's not a right to use. So I would say, as is often the case with these accounting standards, um, you know, our normal English understanding of right to use um, might not always work. In the standard, a right to use an asset very specific gives you the right to obtain all the benefits and to direct the use of an asset. Um, so it, it's, it's a bit different to our normal English. So here, if you have just a right to access and not a right to use direct control the software, um, you would say, I don't have a lease, um, and therefore you receive a service as long as you have a right to access, and it will be expensed um, over the period that you receive that service. Um, now, it would be interesting um, if you have a, um, you know, infrastructure as a service would be really interesting. Um, uh, you know, this is specifically talking about software. Um, and uh, so it was a fairly narrow uh, discussion. Um, they say a right to access type cloud computing software arrangements are common um, because, since they typically do not require a large upfront investment um, and the software is maintained on hardware owned by the supplier. Um, so that's, you know, public cloud, um, you know, Azure, Amazon, et cetera, uh, Microsoft. Um, so the a committee's agenda decision means that many software as a service arrangements will not be accounted for as leases in the scope of IFRS 16. However, you know, as they always say, look at the facts and circumstances carefully. Um, in cases where an entity accesses software hosted on the cloud using its own IT infrastructure, then these could, conclusions would not apply um, because there's no customer-supplier relationship in that situation. So it's important to look at the agreements very carefully. Um, so that's identification of leases. I must say, in practice, identification of leases are continuing to be problematic. Um, a lot of discussion and debate with clients around whether a number of agreements are indeed uh, indeed contain a lease or not, and I would uh, definitely advise you to be cautious around those. However, the biggest uh, issue definitely is determining the lease term. And there's been a lot of discussion, and this has recently um, been debated and a decision reached at the November IFRIT meeting. So let's start with what the standard says. First of all, ASB 16 says, the lease term comprises the non-cancellable period of the lease and periods covered by an option to extend the lease only if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise that option. So there's judgment required. Do we think we'll exercise that option and use that extension um, option? And then the last one, and periods covered by an option to terminate the lease, but only if the lessee is reasonably certain not to exercise that option. So we've got a termination option in three years' time. I'm reasonably certain we're not going to use it. Uh, therefore, the lease period will go on beyond that date. So the lease term comprises three distinct parts. Now, the one that's actually in practice created a lot of difficulty, surprise, surprise, is not the assessment whether we're reasonably certain to extend a lease or whether we are reasonably certain to terminate a lease, although it's problematic and subject to judgment. The one that got everybody by surprise is this interpretation of the non-cancellable period of the lease. Now, uh, at the June meeting, the Interpretations Committee considered a request um, to clarify that part um, of lease term. Now, this is the draft that they released after the June meeting. And during the November meeting, um, this has been confirmed as a final decision. However, 
Um, the IFRIC is not yet released. Um, they are meeting notes from the November meeting. Um, the only reason we know that it's actually been confirmed in November is because our global head of IFRS was at that particular meeting. Um, so they asked IFRIC to look at two angles. And the first one is around a cancelable lease, cancelable lease. Um, this is where the contract includes a notice period of, for example, less than 12 months, and the contract does not oblige either party to make a payment on termination. Um, so either party can walk away. They have to give notice of less than 12 months. You know, do we think, um, you know, th that should be um, included in a lease term? Um, the other one is a renewable lease, and, and they are very similar. A renewable lease is a lease that specifies an initial period and re renews indefinitely at the end of the initial period unless it's terminated by either of the parties to the contract, so the lessor or the lessee. Um, so in Australia, the terminology we often use for that is a lease that's in their holdover period. I had a five-year lease. After the five years, uh, we'd, there's no extension period. Um, there's no renegotiation. We just say we're going to continue to use the asset on a 30-day notice basis um, until the lessor or the lessee cancels. Um, so we're talking about that scenario. Would you now say that your lease is a short-term lease because it can be cancelled on a 30-day basis? And particularly if you go here, that first grey box, the non-cancellable period of the lease, um, if that non-cancellable period of the lease is 30 days only, um, does that mean your lease term is only the 30 days? Um, so this is, you know, a, a quite a big problem in practice. Um, the standard has in it a particular paragraph, paragraph B34, which tries to further clarify lease term. And paragraph B34 is the paragraph that specifically addresses this non cancelable period of the lease. Um, so the request asks IFRIC whether paragraph 34 should be interpreted to mean broader economics in a contract, um, meaning not just a significance of installed leasehold improvements, the importance of the leased asset itself, or whether paragraph B34 should be interpreted as only the contractual termination penalties. So that is a payment specified in the lease contract that a lessee must take to the, make to the lessor if the lessee chooses to terminate the lease. So really what it's saying, if we look at this non-cancellable period of the lease, will we say non-cancellable um, and we consider uh, termination penalties that have to be paid and if there are no significant termination penalties to be paid and the lessor and the lessee can walk away, uh, the cancellable period is only, or the non-cancellable period is only 30 days and therefore short-term lease, therefore we're outside AASB 16. Or do we have to consider a broader economics around whether people will stay in this agreement or not? Um, so the committee noted that the board's view is that the lease term is meant to reflect an entity's reasonable expectation of the period during which the underlying asset will be used because that approach provides the most useful information. So that is in the basis for conclusion paragraph 156. And then the committee in July, in June tentatively, but in November finally concluded that I for a 16 paragraph B34 should be interpreted to consider broader economics of a lease contract and not only contractual termination payments. And that is specifically aimed at determining the non-cancellable period of the lease. So this is a really significant uh, change um, because there were a large number of entities saying, listen, if I've got um, a, a lease um, that's on a month-to-month -month basis, 
it's short term, end of story, not applying the standard. Um, or uh, where we've seen it is between a parent and a subsidiary. Um, maybe it's a completely undocumented lease. Basically, it's a rolling month by month lease, but it's not documented. Because it's not documented, does that mean um, the lease term is just 30 days or one day, etc.? cetera? Um, if you took that interpretation in the past before this decision, um, you know, it would have been possible to get to a lot of short term leases, which would be outside AASB 16. Um, however, this decision really makes it very clear uh, that you look at broader economics. Now, broader economics, what do they mean by broader uh, economics? Um, the next paragraph in the standard talks about in circumstances in which only the lessee has a termination option, to estimate the lease term, a lessee must assess the likelihood, likelihood of it either exercising or failing to exercise that option. And these are the factors that should be considered, but it's not limited to all only this. So contractual terms and conditions for the optional periods compared to market rates, a significant leasehold improvements, um, cost in respect of the termination of, a, of the lease, uh, the importance of that underlying asset to the lessee's operations, um, and conditionality associated with the exercise of that option. So similar things will be considered um, determining your lease term um, for that non cancelable period. Now, our BDO Global team came up with this beautiful decision, decision tree. And because I love decision trees, I would have loved to claim this, and I can't, which is frustrating. And, and they've really said another way to look at this process is to say step one, you look at the period in which the lease is cancelable by neither party. So nobody can cancel it. Um, that is step one. That's the first part of your lease term. You then add step two, and that is the period over which the lease remains enforceable. Now that could be in a number of situations. <coughs> so if you look at your termination options, it could be that there are mutual termination options. So we could say that the lessee and the lessor each can terminate with no more than an insignificant penalty. And remember, when we look at that insignificant penalty, um, IFRIC has just said you don't just look at the penalties and the payments stipulated in the contract, you look at penalties in a broader economic concept. Uh, concept. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an, a practical example that I've seen is let's say you've got an organization, potentially a large government organization in a regional area um, and you've got a month to month lease um, or you're in a holdover period um, for space in a building in that regional area. Um, I've said to the client, so can we move to another building in this town? And, uh, you know, are there other spaces available? Um, and if there are no other spaces available that could be used by government in that town for their staff, we would say there is, a, a, you know, more than an insignificant penalty involved because where are you going to find that building? Um, so it's important to think bigger picture. Another one is if you've put leasehold improvements into a property, however, and you expect those improvements to last 10 years, however, you're in hold over period after five years. And so there would be more than an insignificant penalty if you move out because there's still five years left of um, your leasehold improvements. And when you move to another uh, premises, you'll have to refit out, etc. So when there are mutual termination options, um, we have to consider um, can the lessee and lessor um, each terminate with no more than an insignificant penalty? And, and we look wider than just contractual penalties. If we say yes, um, there's no more than an insignificant penalty, then it's not enforceable and we would not include this in our lease term. However, if we say, listen, um, you know, can the lessee and the, the lessor each terminate with no more than an insignificant penalty? Um, if we say no, 
um, then it's enforceable and you determine the lease term based on an analysis of how long the contract will remain enforceable so reasonably certain to use it. Um, maybe it's the useful life of your 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 fit, your fit out, etc. If only the lessee has termination options, um, you apply step three guidance, which is the next step in blue we look at um, next. And if the lessor only has a termination option, um, it would be enforced. We would say this contract with that period is enforceable. And we include any period covered by less or only option to terminate. Um, so basically, we disregard the option. We're not making an assessment of what we think the less or are going to do. Um, so really, when we look at, at termination options, there's three types. It could be both. It could be only the less or. It could be only the less or. Uh, only the lessee, or it could be only the less or. And um, the, depending on who has the termination option, really leads you to the analysis you need to make. And this is really complex. Um, if you look at um, only the lessee has termination option, uh, you look at step three, and now you have to assess whether they're reasonably certain to exercise these options. Uh, and you look at extent options, termination options, there's guidance, the guidance that I've just referred you to. Um, so I think this diagram is really important and it illustrates all the difficulties around coming up with an appropriate lease term. And the key message from EFRIC is it's not just the legal enforceable term. Um, the legal enforceable term, I would say, is the step one, the period in which the lease is cancelable by neither party. However, from an accounting perspective, we also have to consider the termination options and all the variants there. Um, and then we also have to make in step three a judgment call on what we think is going to happen in future. So again, definitely a, a problem. You'll see in my presentation today, I refer to a number of examples. Now, these examples come from our newly released IFRS in practice um, for IFRS 16 leases. It's been updated uh, a month or two ago. Um, it's a lengthy document. There are some amazing examples in there. Um, I had the privilege of actually getting a tracked changes version of it. So I've tried to include in my presentation all the recent changes and amendments to that publication, which is which is based on recent IFRIC decisions or, or recent uh, decisions um, at a BDO global level. So this example nine, if you want to look at it in the publication or other examples, you can do so. Um, in example nine, uh, we look at an assessment of lease term, and in this one, only the lessee has a termination option. So if we go back to our previous decision tree, the termination option only for a lessee, and therefore we go to the step three guidance where we consider whether it's reasonably certain to exercise. So a customer is considering entering into a lease for equipment to manufacture widgets, the lease has a five-year term with an option exercisable by the lessee only to extend the lease for an additional two years. This means that there is effectively a termination option for the lessee at the end of year five, but not for the lessor. The monthly rental payments escalate at an industry accepted rate based on inflation plus a margin and this escalation also applies to the additional two-year period if the lessee exercises um, its extension option. Now, now the customer operates in a remote location where the cost of shipping and installation of pieces of equipment are significant. So in this situation, if only a lessee has an, an option uh, to terminate, um, one would argue um, that um, we go straight to our, our assessment whether we think that will happen. Um, we don't have to consider paragraph B34. Um, this middle bit, this step two, the yellow bit is paragraph B34. And we're going straight to step three. And therefore, we would argue we think that the lease period is likely to be seven years. Um, it's expensive to ship um, e equipment there. So if we incur the cost to ship the equipment there, we'll try to use it for not only the five years, but for the full seven years.
Um, in example 10, um, we use the same facts and we say, um, but in this instance, both the lessee and the lessor have a termination option at the end of year five, and there's a zero termination payment, which can be exercised without permission from the other party. So this is now interesting. In this situation, again, if we go back to our decision tree, um, our period which the lease is cancelable by neither party, number one is the five years, but now we're in this middle yellow block, the B34. Um, so I think in this situation, because there's a mutual termination option, we would consider can the lessee and the lessor each terminate with no more than an insignificant penalty? Now, if you look here, um, I would imagine that in this instance, um, it would be a lease term of, of seven years um, because, um, you know, um, can the lessee and the lessor each terminate with no more than an insignificant penalty? I would argue no. Um, it's expensive to get it there. Um, you know, I, I, I'll have to get new equipment shipped in. So I would say no, it's enforceable. And now I do a similar analysis to what I've done for the previous example in step three around reasonably certain to exercise that termination option or not. So again, we get to the seven years. So you can see it's important to step through the process. Um, a number of people under, before the IFRI clarified this, would have said the lease term is just five years, end of story, uh, because both parties can walk away. Um, so it's very important to get your head around this assessment, uh, really important. Um, I think the practical implications in Australia where I've seen it is definitely we have holding over periods or hold over periods. A lot of people have argued that hold over periods are not included in the lease term. Uh, and actually already from day one, you should consider um, if you go into hold over period, how long are you likely to stay unless um, you've got no more than an insignificant penalty. I'll give you an example of that. If we're leasing a property in Melbourne CBD um, or a, a floor in a building in Melbourne CBD um, for five years, and we can terminate after the five years, both the lessor and the lessee, and the, we then go into a holdover of month to month, um, I would say, listen, in that situation, I don't think there's a no more than an, an insignificant penalty um, because in that situation um, I could find another floor in another building in Melbourne fairly easily um, but that's on the assumption that we don't have significant furniture and fit out. If there's not similar space available, um, if, they, if I've got significant investment in furniture and fit out um, or if I've got an amazing location um, that's really convenient for my clients and et cetera, you know, one would argue, you know, you have a significant penalty. And remember, it's it's not just looking at termination payments, it's any other economic um, penalty imposed on an entity. And then undocumented leases, I wanted to flag that because Often between parents and subsidiaries, there are undocumented leases. Um, remember, even a verbal agreement is an agreement, and that's clarified in IFRS 15. So if you've got an undocumented lease between a parent and a sub on a, a day by day or month by month, um, you do the same analysis. Uh, it, it's still a, a lease. Um, and the same analysis should be followed. And in Australia, this is pr particularly problematic because we have so many um, separate financial statements. The next one I thought we should look at is recognition and measurement. A number of changes happening here or a clarifications or pro practical problem areas. Now, the first one is um, an interaction between index linked lease payments so CPI lease payments and rent escalation um, clauses. So in, in this one, 
um, Entity K enters into a five-year lease with a base rental cost of $200 per annum, payable in advance. And the rent will escalate at a fixed rate for the first three years, and it will go 200, 200 to 204. Now, this escalation is meant to approximate increases in CPI. However, the increases are fixed and are not variable lease payments dependent on that index or rate. Um, so because it's fixed, it will be included in our calculations. However, for years five and years four and five, the payments will be determined based on the CPI for the immediately preceding year. So, um, that means in year four, the lease payment will be based on the year three payment adjusted for CPI um, during year three, and it will be determined on the first day of year four. Uh, Again, there are no flaws or ceilings in the contract. Therefore, the payments in years four and five may go up or down relative to the year three um, amounts, depending on the movement in CPI for year three. Now, the issue is which amounts for years four and five should be included in the measurement of the lease liability as at the commencement date. So, do we put in 200, 202, 204, um, and then 204, 204? Or, because remember, we don't take in CPI if we don't know what CPI is yet. Or do we go 200, 202, 204, and then back to 200, 200, because we don't know what it's going to be, and there's no flaw? Or do we say 200, 202, 204, 206, 208. So there's a few alternatives here. And in the end, the conclusion um, that was reached is that it's 200, 202, 204. And then because the CPI in year four and year five are linked on the payment in year three, we don't know what that is yet. The, um, included in our calculation for year four and year five would be 204 and 204. So that's one scenario, one example, which is really important, and it's all around index-linked payments. Now, we can change this slightly differently, and it's important to look at the exact details of these agreements. Sorry, I just want to take a sip of water. We could have that the lease contract specifies a fixed escalation of three years for years one to three, similar to our previous example. And at the beginning of year four, there is a contractual market rent review that determines the lease payment for year four based on a specified percentage of the money in year four. Um, the fixed escalation percentage, for example, 3% um, or otherwise, that applies for the remainder of the lease term will also be reviewed at this time. Now, the question is, what should the payments be that are included in the lease's initial measurement? Um, now, two alternatives. Um, some people look at IFRS 16 paragraph 27 B and says variable lease payments that depend on an index or rate should initially be measured using the index or rate as at the commencement date of the lease. Therefore, they say it's 100, 100, 306, and you know, at the commencement of the date of the lease, it was 100 and 100, so we keep it as that. Others are saying, no, no. Um, Paragraph uh, example 14 of IFRS 16 says that when cash flows change, the lease liability is updated to reflect the revised cash flow in all remaining years. Um, therefore, when we go from 100 to 103, all the future ones should be 103 at that stage, 106. And therefore, in year four, we have 106, 106. So at this stage, we don't know what the market review would be for year four and year five. So definitely, you can't continue to increase it to 109, 112. Um, but the issue is, do we at least 
let's keep it stable at the latest known payment of 106 in year three, or do we go back to the 100, um, which was the amount that was known at commencement date. Now, I also want to flag, there's a subtle difference in this example. In the previous example, we were talking about CPI, and the CPI in year four was clearly linked to the payment in year three. So there was a very clear link. So I would have argued, why would we ever go back to day one in that situation? However, year, it's a bit different because we've got a fixed 3% increase and then that we've got this um, market rent review that's linked to market value and market value could be absolutely every anything. Um, so, we, and the other thing is we will also reconsider whether we will accept this fixed 3% increase going forward. Therefore, in, in this situation, really two um, different um, thoughts at the moment. Um, our BDO preference will be for the one in the green um, to say, listen, 100, 100 and 306. We don't know what it's going to be in year four and year five, um, but we would imagine the fact that you have to update all remaining years, you would imagine that it will at least stay the same. Um, therefore, we think the, the green one is the better approach. However, we cannot completely ignore and kick out the blue approach um, because we can see the technical merits for that as well. So at this stage, we have a preference for the green. I, I think just working with clients, I think the green one is more realistic. Um, I haven't seen many leases where lease payments are going down. Um, so I, I think that's more closer to reality anyway. Uh, the other one that's really interesting is a question around co-tenancy uh, clauses. And I thought we should discuss it because um, the answer was fairly interesting. Um, first of all, a lessee enters into a non-cancellable five-year lease in a commercial shopping centre, and the lease payments are 10,000 per month for years one to three, and 12,000 per month for years four and five. So that's your base rent. Now the lease contains a co-tenancy clause which adjusts the amount of lease payments downwards if an anchor tenant vacates the shopping center. So anchor tenants are large tenants that drive significant numbers of customers to the shopping center. So let's say large department stores. Now under the co-tenancy clause, if the anchor tenant leaves, the base rent payments are replaced by an amount equal to 5% of sales revenue arising from the lessee's location in the shopping center. Um, if the anchor tenant space becomes reoccupied, the payments revert back to the base rent. Um, so the base rent payments, when they are replaced to 5% of sales, it means at that stage it's completely variable. Um, and therefore, you wouldn't have, um, if that's the, if you take that into account, you, you won't have a, a, a right of use asset lease liability. Now, at the beginning of year two, the anchor tenant vacates its space, which triggers, which triggers this co-tenancy clause. And there are two issues now. Um, so the one issue is, as at the commencement date of the lease, how should the lease liability be measured? Are the base rent payments the fixed lease payments? Or because the payments could change to 5% of sales revenue, which are variable, should we argue that all these payments are variable lease payments um, and therefore excluded from the lease liability? So you could either have uh, you know, a lease liability in your books or you could have nothing due to this uh, co-tenancy um, uh, clauses. Um, now in our view, the lease liability is measured based on conditions that exist as at the commencement date. Consequently, because the anchor tenant is in place at that date, the lease liability is measured on the basis of the fixed base rent amounts, um, because those fixed base rent amounts meet the definition of lease payments. Now, the co-tenancy clause is designed to be protective in nature for the lessee, and is only activated upon the occurrence of an uncertain future 
event and it's not within the control of the lessee. So that's the first issue. Second issue, no tenancy clause is actually triggered. What is the effect on the measurement um, of the lease? Um, so the triggering of this co-tenancy clause at the beginning of year two does not meet the requirements of paragraphs 39 to 43 to be accounted for as a reassessment. Um, so when an adjustment to the lease liability right of use asset, why? Because it does not result from any of the situations particularly addressed in paragraphs 40 to 42. Um, and the requirement for lease modifications do not apply and there's been no change in the lease uh, contract. Um, this has always been written into the lease contract. Um, so consequently, the lease liability is not remeasured. Um, instead, the, the amount actually paid meaning the 5% of the revenue would reduce, reduces the lease liability. Um, and the lease liability is also reduced for the difference between that amount and the fixed base rent amount uh, with a corresponding credit to profit or loss. So this becomes a quite a complicated calculation. Um, what we've got here is <coughs> the changes in the lease payments are accounted for really as negative variable lease payments in the periods that they occur. <coughs> so currently, if you have a normal variable lease payment, um, your fixed payments impact your calculations. And when you have a normal positive uh, variable lease payment, it will be expense as you pay it. A uh, year will do the opposite and, and it will hit P&L. Um, as you do not pay uh, the fixed base amount, but you pay a lesser amount. Very complicated area, but I thought that's interesting because we thought clients might have that situation in practice or something similar to it. Another one that is really interesting is um, what if we have unresolved a rent review at reporting date? And the question really is, what is the timing of this Remeasurement. So let's say a lessee ended into a three year uh, real estate lease commencing on 1 January year one. Um, the lease has a two year extension option at which time a market rent review takes place. The market rent review modifies the lease payments for years four and five and applies with effect from 1 January. 20 year four, the first day of the extended period. Now, rent reviews can take up to 18 months to complete. And as at 31 December year, year four, the rent review for this lease has not yet been completed. So the lessee paid the year four rent based on the year three rent amount because they're still negotiating what they should actually be paying. Um, although after the adjustment, is finalized and negotiation are finished, um, it will be, you know, an adjustment or a catch up payment will become required um, in 2005. So at 31 December year four, uh, the lessee can make a reliable, re reliable estimate of that retrospective top up payment. Um, that they think will be required. So the issue is really whether the lessee must remeasure that lease liability and based on its estimate of the revised rent prior to that rent review occurring um, since the effect of the review is retrospective. So really is at what stage do we update um, our calculation of our lease liability? Um, is it based on our expectation or once it's formally signed and agreed? And in this scenario, the lessee should remeasure the lease prior to the rent review being completed um, because um, paragraph 42B states that a lessee is required to remeasure a lease liability if there is a change in the future lease payments, including, for example, a change to reflect changes in market rent, reflect changes in market rental rates following a market rent review. So as of 31 December year 14, the year four and five lease payments have not changed as the rent review has not been completed. Um, 
and therefore the lease is not remeasured until the rent review is complete. I'm sorry, I think earlier I said we should remeasure. We should not remeasure um, because it's not completed. Uh, so the principle in ASB 16 is we're not going to make estimates about future increases and future payments. Uh, we actually wait for that payment to be agreed. We wait for the CPR adjustment to be announced. We wait for the new payments to uh, be written into the agreement. So in this instance, at 31 December, you continue to make. So that's really important. The other one is a similar example saying, what if Lessie Z enters into a 15-year lease of land with fixed payments of 10 million per annum, and Lessie Z and the lessor are unrelated parties and are dealing at an arm's length? Now, Lessie Z constructs an apartment building on the land, and at the end of the 15-year fixed term, the lease contains a clause that states the Lessie extend the lease for additional five-year periods of time, at amounts to be negotiated on each extension date. Now, if the lessee and the lessor cannot agree on an amount, arbitration will commence and an independent arbiter, arbitrator will determine the amount of rental payments based on a market study. Now, since Lessie Z has constructed an apartment building on the leased land, it is considered reasonably certain to exercise the options to extend the lease for up to a total term of 50 years, which is the useful life of the apartment building. Now, the issue is whether the yet to be negotiated lease payments are variable lease payments based on an index or a rate um, and therefore excluded from the calculation. Um, the consequence is if is that if they are, they are not included and in that calculation of the lease liability. So this is a, a really big question and it can have a significant impact um, on our calculation. Um, it's important that lease, pay, uh, lease payments included in the initial measurement of the lease as of the commencement date include 15 years of 10 million payments plus another 35 years of 10 million payments because it's variable payments. Um, the 35 years of payments under the reasonably certain to be exercised extension option will be remeasured each, each year from years 15 to 50 as the annual renewals are negotiated with the lessor. So again, in this situation, we said, listen, we don't know, we're not going to guess, we wait until we've got the negotiated rental um, rights. Another similar example, and we've got a lot of questions around this, is timing of remeasurement of leases with variable lease payments based on an index or a rate. And this was a really big practical problem um, with one of our clients. So let's say Lessie W enters into a lease for a five-year term with a lessor for a retail building commencing on 1 January. Lease payments are payable annually in advance at the beginning of year one, um, 1 January. Um, the lease contract states that lease payments will increase each year on the basis of the increase in the CPI from the period 1 December to 30 November. So the updated CPI is published on 15 December. So that is to say at the beginning of each calendar year, the lessee makes a payment based on on the reference amount stated in the lease contract, adjusted by the movement in the CPI from 1 December to 13 November of the previous year. Now, the issue we've got here is whether the lessee should remeasure the lease liability for years two to five on 15 December of year one, since all variability for the year two payments have been resolved. Um, so that's really the question. Do you wait for 1 January to remeasure when you first make the new payment? Or would you say, hang on, I know what the payment is on the 15th of December. There's no more variability and therefore um, we um, update our calculation on the 15th of December. Now, this could be 
a big difference, especially for entities with a 31 December year end. So in our in our view, at the time of the remission, uh, um, sorry, let me just get my my right notes. Um, so what we've said, um, in our view, the change in payments for year year two take effect when all variability relating to them is resolved. So on the 15th of December of year one, we know already what the payments for year two onwards will be. At that stage, we remeasure. Um, the other one that we've talked about in various webinars and sessions are around ongoing changes to leases. And a lot of these discussions here were around remeasurements, you know, changing the original assessment of the term, changes to residual values, changes to CPI or market review, and also modifications, whether we account for them separate or not separate. Um, and this continues to be the biggest practical problem that we see in practice. When we look at disclosure, I thought I should add the quantitative disclosure requirements that we expect to see in the statement of financial position, the statement of P&L, and the statement of cash flows. I think most people, um, you know, understand this and appreciate that we have to do this. Maybe uh, a surprise would be the short-term leases that we've expensed and the low-value low leases that's been expensed. Um, and that would have been um, because we haven't used the practical expedient, uh, because we've used the practical expedient to not include them in our normal calculations. However, uh, those disclosures do not have to be included if the lease terms are less than one month. So that's a further practical expedient around disclosures. I think the one that is maybe more pro problematic are the qualitative disclosure requirements. Um, so we have to disclose a summary of these leasing activities. Um, we have to disclose potential cash outflows that the entity is exposed to that are not included in the lease liability. So all those variable lease payments, all those extension options, termination options, et cetera, all those things that we've decided we're not going to include in our lease liability for very valid reasons, we still have to disclose potential cash outflows arising from them. We should uh, disclose restrictions or covenants imposed by leases and um, information about sale and leaseback transactions. Less or accounting, um, I want to flag two things um, that I've seen in practice a lot. Um, and the, the one um, is around determining the nature of a sublease. Uh, so previously, um, if you've leased a building for five years, you would have said that's an operating lease for you as a lessee. And then if you subleased that building for five years, you would have said it's an operating lease for you as a lessor um, because the lease term is five years and the useful life of the building 50 years. Now, this is changing because your head lease will now come on your balance sheet, the five-year head lease, because all leases are co coming on balance sheet. And when you then consider your sublease, you will say, I'm subleasing the building for five years, my head lease is for five years, and therefore I'm subleasing it for the period that I've got the asset. So it's now a finance lease and I have to de-recognize that asset. Um, so I've got a, a, a slightly different example uh, here that you can have a look at, um, but it's important that that sublease arrangement is no longer automatically just an operating lease. You should consider the period of the sub, sublease relative to the period of the head lease. The other thing that I've seen in practice a bit is uh, when we have that sublease uh, being a finance lease, and uh, we have to work out the re lease receivable. The question has been asked, what interest rate do we use? Um, now, because you as the lessor in the sublease know what your um, interest rate in the head lease is, um, there's a practical expedient that you could use that to account for the lease receivable, which makes um, the calculation a lot easier. So the lessor uses the interest rate implicit in the lease to measure the net investment in the sublease. Um, if their interest rate implicit in the sublease cannot be determined, 
the intermediate lessor may use the discount rate used for the head lease. So we don't want um, these intermediate lessors to have one calc uh, for the head lease and a completely different calc for the sub lease. Uh, the idea is that you can use the same discount rate. Um, so really imp uh, important practical expedient. So if we look at a, a recap of this webinar, um, I've tried to highlight issues around scope, identifying a lease, very important determining the lease term. We've looked at recognition and measurement, and in particular, the ongoing reassessments and modifications. I've just flagged very briefly the disclosure requirements, disclosure requirements so you don't get tripped up by them, as well as less or accounting. Um, as always, um, how can we help? I think the key thing is that I have yesterday set up our webinars for 2020. So if you go to this link, you can register for all our webinars for 2020. Um, and I can see if my link is hopefully working. Hopefully my internet is fast enough so you can get an idea of the topics. Um, so you'll see the topics that I've put up is what is in store for financial reporting in 2020, uh, a number of sessions on leases. Um, in March, we're looking at determining incremental borrowing rate. Oops, I have to close that because the video has started to play. Um, but there are quite a number of interesting topics around leases. The April one is impairment considerations after you've implemented AASB 16 um, and also our normal uh, you know, accounting standards update getting ready for 30 June. So a number of interesting topics. As you know, for for profits, AASB 16 is the big thing. For not-for-profits, it's also the revenue standards. And I'm just here re repeating a lot of previous information about free resources. This IFRS in practice publication, bullet point number three, or triangle three is a great publication. And I also included an overview um, of our, on how we can use you, uh, how we could help you around outsourcing um, or, or, or BDO lead. If you need any assistance on leases, uh, please feel free to contact any of us um, and we help uh, you. We, would love to help you. Um, please send questions through. And then finally, I would like to say thank you very much for joining me. Uh, most of the people who attend our webinars do it um, on a regular monthly basis. Uh, we really appreciate uh, that you join us so regularly. Um, and we hope you'll register for next year and we'll speak to you again next year. Uh, Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a wonderful 2020.